see the progress that we've made over the last year or so. Uh, I'm briefly just going to introduce uh, what we've done with the Magic Database. Uh, it's just intended to, to, get, to whet your appetite if you're going to be here tomorrow, but we'll go into much more detail. And uh, the, the core team for Magic is uh, up there for you to see. Uh, those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of speaking with yet, I'm a, a contractor at OSU. I've been working with uh, Anthony for a little over 10 years now. And um, I've had the pleasure of working with Anthony, Kathy, and Lisa for a long time, and uh, it's a fantastic group to be with. And uh, let me just get started so that we, run, we don't run out of time. So. Um, I'll try and cover some background on the, the new data model and provide some context for the, the changes that we've made and uh, explain a bit about what we mean by having modernized the technology stack. And I'll do a couple of quick demonstrations of archiving and searching in magic. Hopefully that'll go well. So, uh, the new data model. So uh, just over a year ago, we, uh, looked at the way that things were going, and it seemed as though things were getting increasingly complicated. So uh, to give you some context about magic and it's, um, the way that the database is structured, uh, now the software is all MIT licensed and open source on GitHub, so anybody can use it uh, however they please and contribute to it if they want to. Uh, and it's also an effort for uh, transparency so that you know what we're doing with your data. and uh, and we organize all the data sets so that they are associated with the publication. Uh, originally, we'd intended them to be peer-reviewed publications. We relaxed that slightly uh, with the intent that at least we have a document that describes what was done to, to arrive at the data set. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily need to be peer-reviewed. It could be um, a ship report from IODP, for example. And uh, users can put their data into private workspaces and then share it while they're creating the data sets, um, perhaps prior to publication. You could share it with your co-authors or the reviewers. And uh, quite importantly, the data is here to a, a single data model. Uh, Kathy mentioned this yesterday. And it sets us apart from most other uh, archives and repositories of data, because uh, instead of being able to just retrieve a list of data sets, uh, you can actually pick apart the data and then retrieve pieces of data sets and build a separate compilation. And that would be very difficult to do if, if the data weren't in a standardized format. So um, the data themselves, are, as a, are contributions as we, we call them, these data sets are versions so that uh, if you cite it with the data DOI, uh, you're referencing a single version of that data set. And if it changes in the future, uh, we store history of those changes. But um, the actual cited data set is fixed in time. And once a data set is activated or made public, then it's permanent and uh, we don't intend to remove it so that if it's cited, it's always accessible. And uh, datas have, the data sets have data owners. So we have a hierarchy of, of precedence for data owners. So if uh, we've inserted the data set and uh, an original author comes along, they can take over the ownership of the data set. Uh, if it's a third party that wants to maintain the data set who's not an author, they can do that instead of magic. And then if the original author comes along, we um, work out between the owner and the author if uh, there can be exchanged hands. Uh, ideally, we'd like the original authors to be um, responsible for the data that are in magic since so they're potentially the most knowledgeable about it. And uh, the, the data within the data sets are organized into a hierarchy of tables, which I'll get into in a minute. And within the data set, uh, the, each row uh, or result, um, we've reduced the number of fields that are required so that it's a bit more flexible and uh, you can get data in more easily. And each result can have its own list of citations and acknowledgments. So a data set could include data that were originally published in another data set, and then you could cite that as a source, and then you can include that along with the data that are your interpretations and have both side by side and make it clear where uh, the data came from in the first place. And uh, we provide a pretty lengthy list of method codes that's growing, but it's intended for a shorthand way to annotate what was done to derive the data in the data set. Uh, they're organized into 14 groups. There's about 600 of them, um, and we have a tool to search through them. But 
they're intended mainly for um, explaining what each uh, what was done for each row, and they're used quite extensively within Magic, the database, and PMagpie uh, for plotting and for determining whether the, the data are, are complete. The uh, controlled and suggested vocabularies are just applied to a few of the columns, which are often text, and uh, having free text we found has wound up in lots of different versions of, of the same terms. So to try and make things a bit more consistent and able to be indexed more efficiently, uh, some columns are controlled, meaning that you have to use a value in our list, and some are suggested, meaning we have a list of values that we think are good or people have used. Uh, you are free to enter your own, but at least it gives you a starting point and tries to make data entry a bit easier. So the uh, progression from 2.5 to 3.0 has occurred over the last year. Some of you have been involved with, with helping us with that. The um, older version, you probably heard these statistics before, was about 30 tables. 2.4 was 30 tables, 2.5 we got down to 28. But uh, the complication with the old data model was that some of these tables uh, the PMAG results and RMAG results, for example, can be associated with any level in the hierarchy, and it created a um, potential for data to wind up in the wrong place. And despite our efforts to document everything, the, uh, we still wound up with, with issues that needed correcting. So we simplified that considerably from about 30 tables and 1,600 fields down to nine tables and about 650 fields. and um, I don't expect you to read all this, but it just gives you an overview of the nine tables, their purpose, and the fact that we've tried to think of the tables in the context of, of various uh, types of, of data sets and, and approaches. So uh, we can revisit this in more detail tomorrow to see how your data fit into this. So modernizing the technology stack. Um, about a year ago, at the same time that we are considering 3.0, uh, we had to um, switch gears because of the, the database that we we're using, Oracle SDSC, was, was being decommissioned because the license was too expensive. So it gave us an opportunity to uh, look out at what options there were for new tools. And we um, got a list of, of completely new tools to use. And, and this is sort of a, a very brief outline of the way that the, the web has progressed. And within the time that we had developed Magic previously, uh, it was, rather complicated to build a, a full-featured application on, on the internet. And so we just extensively relied on Excel for getting data entry in. And Excel became quite difficult to maintain across different platforms. So uh, newer technologies have uh, introduced something called connected client or rich client applications for the web. And it allows you to develop um, something akin to a full application that you'd run on your on your desktop, but on the internet, and it's always connected to the back end. So data at the back end are always propagated to the front and, and vice versa. So um, after doing quite a, a large review of, of, the, of the tools that we had at our disposal, we came up with what we considered the best options for each of the components. Uh, of course, PMAG is one of them, but uh, we used a uh, meter, which is a an isomorphic design for applications, which allows you to write one package and it be used on both the front and the back end. And <coughs> React uh, is, oh, I might as well actually go through each one of them. So the, um, it, it, it simplifies considerably how you build one of these rich clients. And React encourages you to make sensible decisions about how to manage the separation of concerns with um, components in the user interface. And semantic UI is what we use to do the theming and the templating of the, the website and works well with what we are using for the other components. So p 9 we have running on a server that creates automatic plots and we have plans to use it as a computational engine for doing online interpretations and perhaps customizing those plots. And uh, MongoDB is the data store that we're using, which is much more flexible for us getting data in and especially storing it while it's being worked on in the private view. Um, and Elasticsearch is uh, a really good indexing engine. We were essentially building something along those lines in Oracle, and it just wasn't the right tool for the job and wound up getting very complicated and, and slow. So now we're running Elasticsearch on a server at OSU, 
and we have seen dramatic improvements in the performance. And uh, let me see if I can pull up a few examples. So archiving data magic. So on the magic homepage right now, which uh, is very much a work in progress, and I'll add more information that was on the previous uh, version um, of the, the website. We have uh, a few options. So if you're starting off with a, an older file that you've worked on prior to 3.0, we have an upgrade tool that we've built. And you can select a file. So if I have a file that I know is older, this one happens to be 2.4. It's uh, converted it in place on your machine. So you haven't had to do a round trip up to the server and execute it there and come back again. It all just happened on your browser. And uh, it's taken all of these tables that are in the older structure and reorganized them into tables in the newer structure. The 3.0 format is a tall and skinny format, so it means that you can have multiple uh, results or rows for a single site or sample specimen. We'll get into more details about that tomorrow. Um, in this case, it was a one-to-one -one mapping for all of these. So, um, let's see, the locations had 22 uh, and for a single location. And then um, you can save it as a text file or save it as Excel. So uh, if you save it as Excel, you wind up with this file over here, which might be a little tricky to see on the screen. But uh, so we've created a, an Excel file, which we can both uh, save and, and read in as well, if you prefer working in this format. And we have one, oh, it's not gonna save the zoom on each one, but uh, we have one sheet for each of these tables and it allows you to, um, to organize your data that way. And then the exact same content is also in a text file, but tab a limited text file, which is a bit harder to interpret, but uh, would be able to be read into PMagpie, for example. And if you were to either upload from here, or you can do the same thing by dragging in your saved text file, it passes out the, the data into each of the tables. Um, this would try to make this tool as easy as possible to get data in. One of the, uh, the feedback that we got from the community in the past has been that it's rather complicated uh, to get data in because the data model is complex and because the process of getting the data in was difficult. And so we've tried our best to remove or reduce as many barriers as possible. And we're not there yet, but we're on our way. And one of these has been to relax the way that data go in. So we, you can put in arbitrary files uh, that don't have to be in a magic text format. They could just be a, a table or a tab delimited file. And, um, and then using this tool, you can pick and choose where each of your column headers go. So because this was a magic text file to start with, it knew where to put everything, and um, you have the option to upload it. And then if you were to start over again with something like an arbitrary Excel file, so this could be some specimens that you had uh, with some intensities. And go back and put that in instead. Then the first thing it tries to do is uh, figure out where each of those columns should go. So we knew that this was a specimens data set and it already had the right column headed. But if, it, um, if those were your own column names, you could reassign them to different columns or decide to just omit one of the columns or one of the rows and then upload that to your contribution. Um, and then let me see where the, the same thing can be done with a, an arbitrary text file. That's not. Oh, an arbitrary text file would just be the same sort of thing. So this is uh, an example text file. We, we gave you a few examples at the beginning if you wanted to try things out as well. And so you could do the same sort of thing and choose where it goes and then you would upload it into your data set. So, once you have the data in, you could do a quick search 
And the, the search is something that we're actively working on to reintroduce a lot of the features that we had in the older uh, search interface. So we'll be adding more filtering by custom fields and more searching options and sorting. Um, but it's far more responsive than it used to be. If I look for some of Nick's contributions, for example, and you can download them or you can see the, the history of the contributions and the citation that's associated with it. Um, you could reduce it by what method codes you used. And, um, and a lot of the other features that we want to add uh, include being able to uh, create compilations out of these data sets. So if you find that you like the sites from your result set, you could take all those sites and put them into a new contribution and start from there. Or you could um, save them and analyze them in PMAGPI or in your own software. So um, I think oh, the other thing I want to point out, the data model. Uh, so we've, we've put the, the new the reference for the new data model as well as the old data models as they've evolved. So um, we can see it has um, the previous columns and it has the current columns and it has some labels about um, which fields are required and which ones aren't and some of the validation checks that we'll do on them. You can search for a type of column. So if you're interested in payload intensities or intensities, then you can limit it to which places you can put that. Um, and this is at the different hierarchical levels, uh, location, site, sample, specimen. And uh, it also, um, tells you what the, let's see, if it was mapped from a previous column in 2.5, it'll tell you what the previous mapping was, that this one has to be between zero and 100 because it's percentage, and uh, that it has to be a number, for example. So the, I mentioned before that we have method codes that describe uh, each of these steps. And so uh, there's a similar tool for being able to find the method codes that uh, describe what you're doing. And the more method codes we have, the easier it is to do interpretations and to record what's been done for future projects. And vocabulary lists. So here are some of the controlled vocabularies. It's a list of countries, so don't get misspellings, data types, cold uh, test codes. Anyway, there's quite an extensive list, but. Um, it's all in an effort to try and make a consistent uh, data set that can be reused and documented for future efforts in science. Uh, I think that's enough to cover today. We'll go into more detail tomorrow, but hopefully this at least whet your, your appetite. And if you have any questions that uh, you'd like answered now, I'm delighted to answer them. The, sorry? The yeah, that's on the older website, yeah. Is that what you wanted to see? Yeah. So, yeah, a little while ago, we, we made this data management plan tool where you can create a Word document or actually PDF uh, that is intended to adhere to the guidelines for creating a, a data management plan for your um, proposal. And um, you can make some decisions about uh, what kinds of data you're going to include and what you're going to do. And it gives you um, some uh, previews of what, what gets created in each of the, the stages. And um, it's geared towards the data management plan being to put your data into magic, which is where we'd like it to go. But you could use it as a template for, for any plan that you might have. But it's certainly encouraging that the data wind up in an archive that's searchable and uh, and maintained in uh, for a long time at least. And we we prefer that than putting it on your own website or or just linking to it on the web somewhere. And um, and a, a, at least to have it in a, a place that's uh, citable and um, and so we provide a few options here that, that have some canned text for how these data will be archived 
and you can save your management plan to PDF. And it's a handy tool that uh, I know Kathy's used it several times. And uh, <laughs> regardless of whether I'm collecting data. <laughs> but uh, we'd, we'd be happy to, to help you use this or, or to get feedback on improving this. This is also one of the tools that will migrate over to our new system, which will make it even easier to use, I suspect. But we're in the process of prioritizing what gets worked on first, but this seems to work reasonably well in the old system for now. Anything else? Yes? Uh, so, especially in light of uh, recent events, how permanent is permanent and how do we really ensure right. permanence? Yes, so uh, we, we've discussed this in the past and um, there are obviously complications with maintaining a data set if you don't have funding anymore. One of the advantages of being under an umbrella like Earthref is that Earthref has several organizations that it works on. And so um, the chances are that if there's no longer active development on one, that it will still be maintained because there's active development on another. And the size of the data sets these days are small enough that storing them as they are is not incredibly costly. So we can easily archive them and freeze, freeze their contents if necessary without incurring a huge amount of costs. But that would be less desirable than maintaining an active database that continues to be searchable. Yeah. So I think also in answer to your question, Bob, uh, one of the things that we're very conscious of with Magic is that the paleomagnetic community is national. And um, ultimately, I think what we would like to see is that this has um, many homes and that that will secure its longevity so that it's not just an NSF-based project. There are a lot of people who are interested in using the European protection for the Upon the Ray and the Wild Creek involved in this EPOS EU project. And um, I think that <coughs> it's certainly true that facilities don't maintain themselves. And that's what we see always in everything that we see on the web. But I think as long as there's community interest in using the observation, that we'll, we'll find a way, one way or another. Um, Thank you. Ah, my pleasure. Was there one more question? <laughs>